I'm Beth Perrell here with Mickey Meyer. She's Lord Family Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Community from Rollins College. And we're going to talk about this exciting new project underway. Rollins is building and and doing a renovation of its Student Life Center. It's called the Mills Building. And there's a whole bunch of goals that you have attached to this. So welcome, Mickey. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Beth. So good to be here. So when we talk about renovation, you know, we picture the building, et cetera, but there's, there's, there's a lot in this particular renovation in terms of what's going on with students. Sure. What, you know, I'm, I'm going to take even a step back further mm-hmm. because what I think is really important when we think about the changing landscape of higher education and creating conditions, physical conditions on campus for students to learn, It's important for us as educators to think about how we're creating buildings and in very intentional ways that allow students to connect and engage and build partnerships. When I think of buildings on a college like Rollins and the older buildings, I I think of them as being sort of inspirational. I'm at college and it's, you know, the majestic and all of that. But that's not what the young kids want, is it? Right. They want a twist of that. So what you're seeing, Beth, um, was really the legacy of Hamilton Holt. And a little bit about Hamilton Holt. Hamilton Holt was the president of Rollins. He came to the campus in the 1920s, the mid-20s. The thing that was exciting about him is he actually was not an academic. He shamed academics. He believed that learning had to be Socratic. It had to be done as with teachers and learners and professors were students and students were professors. And if you look at the majestic campus of today, It was Holt that built that campus and those classrooms. He gave way to the education that we we see today. And so now as we come into the 21st century and thinking about still what students want, they still want hands-on. They still want pragmatic. They still want their teachers to be learners, and they want to see themselves as teachers. But physical spaces need to change and elevate. And so the college has been going through a strategic planning process for the past three years. It's been led by Grant, President Grant Cornwell, who came to, to Rollins from the College of Worcester, an incredible visionary. And when he came to Rollins, he saw that there was a lot of great things happening, but didn't quite believe that our campus was situated to educate students for what their needs and what they'd like today. Hence, these building projects, actually 12 of them that are happening at Rollins at one time. Wow. Significant, a significant um, undertaking for a campus that was built in 1885. But they're building, they're projects with purpose. They're projects that are going to allow us to use existing spaces and transform those spaces to create collaborative learning, integrative pedagogy, and ways for students and faculty to engage together. Okay, so when I said the Mills Building, are these 12 projects in that one building or they're 12 separate buildings? Right, they're, they're, they're projects all across campus. Okay. The Mills Building is Mills Memorial Hall. It was originally a library. It's the center building on campus. So if you come onto campus down Holt Avenue and you look to your right, you see this beautiful iconic building that's set back from our big lawn. And in your mind, you think, okay, that's where the magic happens. It's the center building on campus. But really, that after that, that building was not a library anymore, when the Olin Library was built, it really kind of lost its way. It had a different um, smorgasbord of programs and activities that happened, event spaces and community, civic and community engagement programs. But that building was not really built intentionally to house programs since it was a library. So the front of the building had three full floors and the back had six because those were the old library stacks. So renovating that building, our center building on campus, really is the lead domino and all these different building projects that are going to be happening over the next couple years, including a new, a brand new residential complex, a Fred Stone Theater, renovations to our baseball stadium, and then over time, um, res- renovations and, and a brand new Cromer Graduate School of Business, which will bring together all of our art and our Cornell Fine Arts Museum and the Alfond Inn. So this is a big undertaking, which means that it really means a lot to the college itself. You really see this as being necessary. All of it is going to make a big difference as we are making our way through the 21st century. Yes, absolutely. As we know with the the millennial generation and Generation Z, we hear that students 
although they're focused on technology, um, they're focused sometimes in isolation and doing their own their own thing, there still is this longing for connection and community. And we see this across the country, that colleges and universities are creating, intentionally creating spaces that bring students out of the residential hall rooms and bring them onto campus to be collaborating together. And whether that be on a science project or a community-based project or even in a, a book book dialogue group or book book circles, we see that they have a need to connect with their peers, to learn from one another. And unfortunately, on many campuses, spaces aren't, haven't necessarily been conducive to that type of collaborative learning. Now, why is that? What, what are the spaces like or have they been like that sort of preclude the students gathering? Right. Well, I can say for other campuses, not necessarily Rollins, but think of the lecture hall. Lecture halls, to me, say one-way learning. You have the sage down the stage and the students are on the side. We know that students don't necessarily enjoy learning in those ways. They want to learn, engage together in collaborative learning projects, community-based projects. So that's one example. You know, fortunately, at Rollins, we only have a few lecture halls. Well, and, and also when you're in the lecture hall... It's not just that the learning's one way, it's that you're less inclined to turn to the person behind you and strike a conversation up exactly. about what do you think about this. Exactly. And that's the great thing about Mills, this new Mills project in Mills Memorial Hall. And I want to talk through some of those spaces where you can see where this collaborative learning is going to happen. So we're going to have something called a scale-up classroom, which is a classroom that has completely movable furniture. And every wall has a whiteboard. Students all get their own personal whiteboards, and there's technology across the room. So that at any point, the point of orientation of the room will shift and change to show that at any moment, a student can be a teacher and a teacher can be a student. A second example of such a space that evokes collaboration and innovation is we're building a social innovation and entrepreneurship lab. It's a space where students will come together and engage in human-centered design thinking. So thinking about problems and challenges and then using empathy, using ideas to create solutions for that. So again, highly flexible, lots of whiteboards, prototyping materials, 3D, 3D printers, but it's all focused around the student as, as really as expert in the classroom working alongside their peers and problem solving. Yeah, but how do you then encourage the the humility that is real sort of genius and knowing I don't know it all and how do I learn what I don't know? Well, that's the whole beauty of a liberal arts education. It teaches that from the very first day that mm -hmm. students come on to campus. It teaches them that they have something to bring to the table, but they only know what they know and there's a whole circle of unknowing that's out there. A lot of that is done very intentionally through the ways in which we establish our general education curriculum and expose them to so many different topics and ideas. So when I share students as teachers, it doesn't mean students as necessarily as experts, but that students are a part of the learning and teaching process alongside their peers and alongside their faculty. You know, another interesting thing that you said that just really struck me is you're talking about, and everybody will have a whiteboard, which is not high tech. The tech is in there. And I think sometimes when renovations happen, it's all about, can we get a laptop port, you know, and, and it's all about that exclusive technology is going to do it all. You're saying it's a mix of things. You know, that's been the exciting part, Beth, about this project is my fear is we were going to go into this 21st century building and not be able to, to, to outfit the building because we wouldn't have the funding to really do the technology. But what we are learning from faculty is the most important part is flexible furniture and the ability for students to write on whiteboards and, and, and create and share their ideas. Now, there's elements of technology that will be a part of it. But really, the tech, I don't think of the technology as a Cadillac. I actually think of it more as a Nissan Leaf. It's functional. It's utilitarian. And it's exactly what we need 
in those spaces for students to engage in collaborative learning. Go ahead and give people an example of what collaborative learning would be like in one of these spaces. When we say collaborative learning, a lot of us would say, what does that mean? Okay, sure. So collaborative learning might be a prompt from a professor to think about poverty, for instance, and have students research and think about all the reasons that there's poverty here, we'll say here in the United States, from cultural to systemic to economic. And then students would go out and engage in in ethnography and research around the topic and bring those ideas back to a classroom and start to grapple with some of those ideas around poverty. From that, starting to prototype what could be different solutions when it comes to poverty. So that's an example of collaborative learning, but we can do it in so many different ways, case studies, case-based learning. But a lot of it comes from an understanding that we, we can teach things from a book, but we can also give students great challenges for them to uncover and think about. There's a beautiful example of this um, through our social innovation and entrepreneurship program. We run a, a pitch competition called the HALT, the HALT Prize. It's a global pitch competition that gives a prompt, and students have to come up with, solu- with a solution. And the prompt last year was how to provide energy access to 20 million people worldwide. That was the prompt. And actually, we had a group of students that came together with an idea to develop recycled batteries. And these batteries would be able to create energy um, across the world. Their idea went all the way to the finals, which was incredible. Um, Out of over 100,000 ideas and prototypes, they went through every stage to get to London to go to an incubator to further develop their idea. That's amazing. And I think also embedded in that is not just what came out at the end, the ideas they generated, but each one brought some level of understanding about what they had experienced and were able to share it. And that's what led to generating the idea. Absolutely. The liberal arts in action. So understanding the liberal arts and understanding that the world encompasses multiple different disciplines, and every discipline needs to be around the table to engage and solve some of the greatest challenges of our time. And something that you see on our campus now, which has been a huge shift, is many of our buildings are set up as cross and multidisciplinary. So take the Bush Science Center, for example. The old way that our science center was developed is you had the chemists in one corner and the biologists in another corner and the computer scientists on another corner. But what we've done is integrated all of those faculty offices and departments so that you have chemists and biologists and physicists and computer scientists working side by side together to think about how their disciplines are all interconnected and creating change in the world. And because they're close by you can have those conversations, right? right? Because a lot of that doesn't it happen. You're on your way somewhere and you go, oh, hey, how are you? And here's the idea. And, and if you're in different places, you're isolated from each other. None of that sort of instantaneous right. brainstorming happens. Engineered collisions. Yeah. They're, <laughs> there collisions you go. they're collisions by design. Absolutely. When, when people can walk um, and see each other's offices, when they're in the restroom together, when they're using the old fashioned um, water station, that's where we know, that's where the relationships develop and the magic happens. So at Rollins, is there a lot of the online education? And if so, how do you bring them in the loop? You know, Rollins it doesn't have a strong online presence mm-hmm. as other institutions do. We've got some classes that have, have hybrid online assignments, but really it's not part of our educational experience and our, con- and our content delivery. Um, there, there are other institutions that do that sort of thing with flipped classroom models, um, but really at Rollins, it's not what we focus it's on. It's not what you focus on. And why don't you take a moment to talk about liberal arts? Because I think a lot of people, when they're considering you know, college, they think, well, I'm going to be a blank, and that means I have to be in a blank program. And maybe they don't really see how liberal arts is the stepping stone for that. Exactly. Well, the liberal arts teach you how to think. They teach you how to feel and they teach you how to do. And they're the classic disciplinary knowledge, English, mathematics, music, language, ethics, that I believe really are the foundation for a a whole person and a holistic education. So if you think about um, colleges like Rollins or liberal arts colleges, usually you see three pieces of their curriculum. 
The first piece is a student's major. It's what they want to focus in. And those are a series of discipline-specific courses that will prepare them for biology, business, English, etc. Another piece of that, then, is their general education curriculum. And the, the, the greatest value, value differentiator between schools to schools is actually their general education curriculum because your gen ed is what your institution values. These are the classes that are highly engaging. They're, they're cross-disciplinary. They're things from ethics to language to the arts to studio art to his, art history to history to political science that I believe gra- create a well-rounded, grounded person. And then the third piece of your education at many schools are your elective credits. There are things that you have a passion and an interest in exploring that might not necessarily be part of your major or part of your general education curriculum. These can also be things that are extremely important in today's day and age, which would be internships or studying abroad or participating in a capstone project. So you can go out and become an X or a Y person, but if you think about your entire um, educational experience, that's what liberal arts are, what, what we call now liberal learning does best. It's taking diverse ideas, it's building critical thinking, and allowing people to go out and do incredible things in the world. So it allows you to draw from all of those areas to innovate, to problem solve, and actually to identify what the problems are? Yes, Yes, absolutely. So the students themselves, and, and back to the buildings and this, how much did you talk to students versus, you know, make the assumption, as we all do, this is what they want? I mean, how involved were students in deciding what these renovations would be? Uh, very, very involved from the very beginning. These ideas for the building projects were birthed out of our strategic planning process that students were a part of first. Second, as we've moved forward in creating and identifying which buildings were going to be renovated and specifically which programs were going to be housed in the buildings, students were a part of that process. So I'll give you an example. Student government looked at all of the plans. They gave feedback and suggestions. They named a few of the spaces that are going to be in the Mills building, including our Fox Den. So the Fox is beloved to Rollins. You might have heard of Fox Day before. It's the day the president puts a statue of a fox on the spring and he cancels classes for the day. So students are very connected to this idea of the fox. So they named the student lounge the Fox Den. Students are involved in this creation of our social innovation and entrepreneurship hub. Uh, We have a radio station, WPRK, which is the best in basement radio. Um, Students completely have develop that space, have made the decisions on that space. Our student newspaper will have a space. In fact, I'm running a process right now that involves about 150 faculty, staff, and students across campus that are in 13 cross-functional teams to make sure that there's representation in every ounce of this building. So students have been at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. So we're here to share this message beyond Rollins. And so for those people outside of Rollins, why is this a message for them? What should they take away from what you're doing? So first, what's really exciting, I think, for our community in Central Florida is we are preparing global citizens and responsible leaders that will be leaders here in our community. Students who not only can think critically, but can act reasonably and can connect their head and their heart and creating change in this community. So that's exciting. I think that's exciting for people who live in Central Florida to know that their coworkers and their neighbors who might be Rollins graduates are being prepared with this very type of education that I'm talking about. I think the second thing that is important to know is that education is changing. Young people have a voice. Young people have expressed interest in the very types of things they're interested in learning about, and the research shows this everywhere. And what are those things? Young people are passionate about sustainability in the environment, and they're looking for ways to engage in those topics as a part of their academic curriculum. Students are very, very deeply engaged and interested in civic and community engagement and want to participate in some of the greatest challenges that we see and face in our world. Students want to study abroad. In fact, at Rollins, over 70% of our students will go abroad at least one time 
during their time at Rollins. That's significant. The world is becoming more connected, more global. Young people want to participate in that more. So for schools that are understand the ability to connect curriculum, academics, and disciplines with pragmatic, hands-on opportunities, project-based learning, opportunities in the community, internships, they're going to really be able to attract this generation of students that want to take their education to the next level and do good. And it sounds great for the rest of us to learn that they are out there with those attitudes that are going to make a difference for all of us, including me in my old age. So I'm <laughs> yes, glad to hear exactly. all that. And speaking of old age, I mean, you surely have, you know, the students are, are younger, but you are all about lifelong learning at Rollins, aren't you? We are. In fact, next year, our Hamilton Holt Evening Programs will celebrate their 60th anniversary of providing quality excellent education to non-traditional students and graduate students. So at Rollins, we do have a strong and vibrant undergraduate College of Liberal Arts, but we also have opportunities for adult learners through our Hamilton Holt School and, of course, our grad, our Crummer Graduate School of Business that's consistently ranked as a top business school in our community. Now, how does that figure into what you do with renovations and how you look at how to set up the classroom the fact that you do have these older students? So um, for students in our Cromer Graduate School of of, um, Business, more students are going to business school because they're interested in the triple bottom line, people, profit, and planet. So our social innovation and entrepreneurship lab becomes extremely desirable for young people that want to use a business degree to create change, whether whether they're social entrepreneurs or even nonprofit leaders that are passionate about social enterprise. When it comes to our Hamilton Holt School, something that we're going to see in this new building is different hours of operation. So our career and life planning colleagues are creating an entire career studio that will happen later into the night. So our our returning students who come back for evening programs are able to engage in the very programs that our undergraduate day students are able to. So you've mentioned planet, you've mentioned sustainability, so surely those two watchwords are a part of the plans for the renovation. Yes, we couldn't do it any other way. So the firm that we're using, EYP, is a leader in sustainability and sustainable business decisions when it comes to renovations and projects. And we have a student sustainability committee that's overseeing a lot of the decisions on campus. when it comes to these renovations. And so we'll use recycled materials when available, um, locally harvested wood, locally sourced materials. And in fact, we've got a group that's thinking about storytelling and curating through the building to talk about how much water we're using in our restrooms to energy efficient lights and light fixtures. It's really exciting because that was something that was very, very important to our students from the first from the first day of this is we can't walk the walk if we don't really put into action what our values are around sustainability. On the other hand, you want to maintain your heritage and and some of those older buildings. So how are you hanging on to what you need to hold on to from your past while you're making this very modern effort? If you notice, what we didn't do was completely knock down the building. Right. So right away, we're thinking about sustainability as we're making decisions. We're, 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 We're hanging on to the pieces that are very much viable, which honestly was half the building. It was the back half that we weren't really able to use because they were the old library stacks. And I think a lot of times people don't realize that it can be a both and and. You can embrace the future. You can focus on the environment, but also use pieces and of, of tra- traditional pieces in order to make projects happen. Was there something for you personally that was sort of a a, a pet project or sort of a thing that you really wanted to hang on to? Or or the opposite, something you really want to (laughs) change? Well, what I find so exciting, and maybe my colleagues wouldn't agree, (laughs) is, you know, the old academic building would have large offices for faculty and staff. And honestly, as our work changes as academics and as staff, it needs to become more flexible and more mobile. And we know as the new generations of people are coming into the professoriate or into staff, they value flexibility and mobility. They like co-working. They use laptops. They use phones. They use technology. They'd rather, be, they'd rather not be tied to physical space and have technology to be able to engage with others. 
So for me, it's exciting that we have given up the old big office idea. Every person in the building, no matter if they're an assistant vice president or a staff member or a faculty member, has the same size office. It's about 90 to 95 square feet, which are small. They're transparent, so they're glass. But in doing that, we've created more community spaces. And I think in urban planning, we're seeing this too. People are giving up more physical space in order to have more community space that really allows people to come together. So that, that's the one piece about this project I'm most proud of. It's like even focused on the students. Yeah, like even in homes, right? We want to have that sort of big group area where everybody could have their devices, but you can still look across and say hi to the kids or, and so on. It, absolutely. We're seeing that in how we're building residential units as well. Mm-hmm. Smaller personal living spaces, larger communal spaces. People do want to be together in community. So a lot of people have been listening to us right now, including young people who are looking to college. And of course, the one thing, uh, as great as you've made it sound, everybody would love if they had some financial assistance. So you want to tell us about your scholarships? So over 80% of college of students at Rollins receive some sort of financial aid. And a lot of people don't realize that. The college is extremely generous when it comes to giving financial aid. We have merit-based scholarships. We have need-based scholarships. We have programs like the Alphonse Scholarship. The Alphonse Scholarship comes from the revenue of the Alphonse Inn, which is in Winter Park. It's a social enterprise, our hotel, that provides a full-ride scholarship to about 10 students a year that's completely full-ride. We've got scholarships that are focused for students who are passionate about community service. And so a lot of times I think that people look at our education and they think, I can't imagine being able to afford that price tag. But the college is deliberate and focused in providing aid. In fact, it's close to $50 million in student financial aid every single year. So no one needs to be afraid. Exactly. All right. Well, it's been exciting hearing about this. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Beth. We've been talking about the renovations taking place at Rollins College. My guest today, Mickey Meyer. She's Lord Family Assistant, Vice President for Student Affairs and Community. I'm Beth Perrell.